welcome to Protecting Our Freedoms podcast. I am your host, Joy Vatrebeck, with my co-host, Mark Renahan. How are you, Joy? I'm good. How are you, Mark? I'm excellent today. Excellent. Well, today we are going to start a four-part series called Perspectives on Afghanistan, Past, Present, and Future. I know we've uh, Afghanistan has been in the news a lot, obviously, um, what's going on there. But we wanted to bring perspectives from contractors and other professionals who have worked with people in Afghanistan. So today we have Ms. Beth Sarika joining us, and she has worked with Afghan women and children. But first, Mark, how can people support our podcast? Yeah, you can watch us on our Facebook page, which is www.facebook.com forward slash protecting our freedoms with two S's. The other one was taken at the time. We're on YouTube. We're on Rumble, Podbean, um, any of your favorite ways to watch a podcast. And you can visit our website at www.ascf.us and donate to keep our podcast going. And like Joy said, today we are beginning a four part series on Afghanistan. We have a really great guest. We're trying to get different perspectives from different people. I know we always have a lot of veterans on our show, but we're trying to do a little different thing today. So without further ado, we have Miss Beth Sarika. I pronounced it correctly. Beth, how are you today? I'm doing well, and you did a perfect job at pronouncing it. Excellent. (laughs) Thank you. Well, Beth, uh, I want to just get right into it. Before we get into your Afghanistan experience, uh, I know you were a police officer for a long time in your your beginning career, I guess I would call it, and then you got contracted to go over and work in Afghanistan. So maybe you can tell us just a brief bio of yourself and and how you ended up in Afghanistan and what you were doing there. Sure. Well, um, I was in law enforcement for 23 years in Sanford, North Carolina. I started out as a dispatcher, as we used to call it in the old days, and then we graduated to telecommunicators. But I uh, I don't know. I just, I was a single mom. I wanted to get on the other side of the desk and I wanted to prove to my sons that you could do whatever you set your mind to. So went through basic law enforcement training and started a career as a sheriff's deputy. And then as a result of an election that didn't quite go our way, (laughs) I went to work for the city of Sanford police department where I ended up. My last job there was in narcotics. Oh, wow. So, all yeah. right, so so cool. Beth, you, you finished your career as a police officer, and um, Joy was telling me that, and then we spoke briefly earlier, and you get contracted to go over to Afghanistan. Maybe you could we could just dive right into it. I know I'm rushing, but no, no. Um, so as a narcotics agent, I was just kind of getting a little bit of you know job burnout, and one of my um, partners had been uh, in the special forces, and he did a little contract work when he retired from the army. So he said, have you ever thought about contracting? And I was like, no, it's contracting. And he said, well, you know, they offer, the government offers all kinds of contracts to go all over and do all kinds of things. And he said they have one in Afghanistan that's supporting, you know, the NATO mission to help rebuild the infrastructure. So I was like, yeah, they'll never hire me, you know. But honestly, they really needed women because out of like 600 and some male police officers, We only had about 40 women from the United States who actually, you know, qualified to go over, you know, for the training mission. And uh, so what our job was there was to work with the Afghan Women's Police Corps in a family response unit, which um, we helped, you know, educate on domestic violence and women's and children's rights and stuff like that. So that's actually what got me there. So the Afghan Women's Police Corps, that's through the uh, Department of Defense or? Well, actually, the the mission that I started out on was with the Department of State. And the first two years I was over there, we worked with the Department of State. They lost the funding for it. So then we were then contracted by the Department of Defense. So kind of changed our hat a little bit. The Department of State had some different you know, mission rules that we had to go by. And then the Department of Defense, that was like a whole nother ball game when we started working with them. Mission stayed the same, but it was just a little different as far as dealing with um, the red tape of working from the State Department to a military operation. So, okay. I have a quick question. So the, the, the Afghan woman's, what was it called again? Woman's police? Was that a was that a, a U.S. sponsored or did you arrive and they already had set up a Afghan female police unit that you worked with? Or did you set that up yourself when you got over there? No, actually, uh, 
it's kind of, well, I'll start like from the, the ground up. So it was a NATO mission, basically. So when I first got in country over there, um, we worked alongside of people, uh, police officers from the United Kingdom, England, all over the place. We had, you know, pe- uh, police officers that were there as part of their job, but they weren't contracted. They were just there as doing their job. So whenever I first got in the country, um, we had a couple units that worked in my division. We had uh, one unit that specifically was, um, our focus was to train the women's police corps. We had a team that went out to the women's police academy every single day and trained them. They did all the, um, you know, points of learning and all that stuff for them, all the curriculum, firing ranges, they did all that stuff. We had another branch of our unit that focused on going out to the police stations. So I was on that team. So we would go out to the uh, field every single day. We would go into the police station, sit down with the police chiefs, visit the women that worked in the police stations. And along with that, we also got to go to schools. We got to go to prisons. We got to go to visit women, you know, in a lot of different areas all over Afghanistan. And then we had another unit, which was the family response unit. So if you can think about a domestic violence unit in the United States, that's what that was. And it was actually started by um, a lady from the, from England who actually started that program. It was her, I guess, baby to go in and develop their, um, the way they dealt with domestic violence and women's and children's rights and stuff like that. Because up until this whole NATO mission, they probably never even, you know, had units that focused on that. And just to get an idea, what, what year was this, what we're looking at? I went over in October of 2009 and I came home in October of 2013. Oh, wow. So Beth, Beth, you know, before we get more into the police work version of it, um, I can tell a little bit from your accent that you may be a Southern gal. Am I correct on that? Just a little bit. Uh, just a little bit. And uh, I, I want to make sure you know I am not mocking your accent as I speak with the worst Boston accent mm. known to man. Mm-hmm. I actually love um, accents throughout the country. I find them to be fascinating. Um, but my question to you is you're a, you're a Southern girl and you, you finished your police work. Uh, I know Afghanistan's been in the news a ton in a, a lately, you know, and actually over, I'm, I'm almost 50, over my whole life, it's, you know, with the Russians invading mm-hmm. and all that. But what was your, I guess, A, initial reaction, and B, just, what was it like being this, you know, you're a North Carolina cop, you're a North Carolina sheriff, you're heading over. What was your first take, or what was your experience, I guess, with Afghanistan for people listening at home? So... I'd never in my life been out of the United States. I've traveled to a two or three different places. So I went through a two-week training program in Virginia, and they put us on a bus, took us to the airport, put us on a plane, and we just uh, stopped in through Dubai and then went on into Afghanistan. And when I first got off the plane, I was very nervous but because uh, I was there was only two females out of 56 men that went over there. So went in and the airport, very small, you know, they look at you like, you know, you're a woman, what are you doing over here and all this stuff. So very intimidating, went from the airport dragging uh, duffel bags that weighed 50 and 60 pounds all the way to the armored vehicle that picks us up, got out the end of the airport and I'm like, what in the world have I gotten myself (laughs) into the first time I decided to leave the United States? And I come to a third world war torn country where I'm greeted with AK 47s and tanks. Okay. Just for the record, Beth, most people go to Cancun on <laughs> yeah. their first trip out. So, right. you know, I, I don't know if you have any other foreign trips planned, but I, I would maybe Cancun, Bahamas, maybe another one, even though, you know, so, but anyway. Well, hey, I got a shout out for women on that one. Though, yeah, Beth. no, it's, that is, that is incredibly impressive. Oh, yeah. So now you're in Afghanistan and, you know, you're, you're the first day is over and you, you're going to start your new job. What, what was that like? I guess like just were you, I mean, I guess you must've been nervous, you know, as anybody is with a new much, job. Well, but. very much so because the, the compound that we lived on was it, you know, it had a barrier wall in it. We had guard towers and stuff and we were put in um, 
two man room. So, and it was uh, it's metal buildings. It's very, you know, you're sleeping on a, a steel frame bed with a mattress on it. So it wasn't like you were at a four star, not even a one star hotel. I would consider it more of a glamping experience, but Second night there, right in, I, I woke up in the middle of the night and my bed's shaking and I'm thinking, do they have tanks on this compound? And I was like, no, it was the first earthquake that I've ever experienced. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh my goodness. You're getting all the firsts so in your first trip out of country. AK 47s and I get greeted by my first earthquake that I ever experienced. So. <laughs> oh my goodness. Now, Beth, we were talking earlier offline, uh, just uh, in general, uh, the three of us, when Joy and I like to speak to our guests before the show, and you were telling us, and I, I didn't know this, and I have a feeling that nobody who's listening to this that isn't a, a former Afghan veteran would know that in Afghanistan, if a woman is arrested and she has children, her children go to jail with her? Is that what you would tell us? They do, and I can't remember what age, but it's like up to the age of seven or 11, I think, the kids. Wow. No matter what the woman goes to jail for, and it could be just about anything over there from, you know, running away from arranged marriage to murder to whatever, you know, that they do. Um, And sometimes it takes years upon years for these cases to go before a judicial system. And it all depends on how much money the family has. So uh, I know that probably people are aware of the corruption you know, that's within and that was within the government over there. So that was something that, you know, we saw daily that the poorest of the poor were often the ones that got treated the worst just because they didn't have the funds to get them out of whatever incident that they were in. Mm, I can't imagine the kids being in prison with mom. What what was the... The culture in general was like, like the food, for example. What did you, what did you, you know, I know that one of the things when I've been talking to guys... Um, I talked to a lot of vets during the, you know, the recent Afghanistan things, and a lot of them were talking about they worked with incredible interpreters and allies of uh, U.S. forces while there, and they were concerned that you know, a lot of these folks are going to be now integrating to the United States, and the cultures might clash, but these are really good, you know, good folks. What was your take on the culture from, you know, from everything, from food to entertainment? Like, I guess that's another question. I know I'm asking too many at the time, but what, what did you guys do? Like, you know, not that Saturday night was a specific night, but if you had a night off, was there any, you know, any, any R&I when you were there? So being it was like a, a military type of um, operation, we had MWR, MWRs, which um, was a room dedicated to you know, they had a TV in there. You could get all kinds of DVDs. Um, most of the time we just had like a fire pit or something we'd hang out around or, you know, we'd hang out in somebody's room or we would have a TV in our room where we would buy t- uh, dollar DVDs from the local Haji shop and, you know, watch or read or whatever. But no, it wasn't anything that you could get in your truck and go out and you know, go on the local market to do any shopping or taking any entertainment or whatsoever. So it was just mostly, you know, whatever we could find on the compound itself. There's all different kind of compounds over there. Some are nicer, you know, some are huge military fobs where you're in a tent with 200 other people and you have shared showers and all that stuff. So, you know, there were some good places that I stayed in and then there were some glamping places that I stayed in. So you moved around the country quite a bit then? Yeah, um, I started off in Kabul, then I got stationed in Jalalabad, um, spent some time in Mazar, spent some time in um, uh, Kandahar, uh, some other places. So as I was over there, I actually got to be in a supervisory position. So as part of being a supervisor, I got to travel more to go out and check on our teams that we had out in the field that were associated. Some of our teams would go out with military um, escorts, you know, when they were going out, some of our guys lived on Ford operating post. Um, We had, we had probably, well, we had 600 uh, cops over there at one time from the United States alone, you know, just doing various training, whether it was military army, the ANA or the ANP. And as Mark was talking about, sorry, Mark, um, Culturally, um, a little earlier, well, can you speak to how the Afghan women um, accepted you coming in, or any Americans, I guess, coming in culturally? 
especially as a woman? Would it be, was there a difference between you and a man? Oh, total difference. So um, most of the time, most of the women, they kind of looked at us as an inspiration or they looked at us as something that they really dreamed of being because in the local police departments over there, you had women that served chai. You had women that worked in a room at the gate searching women that came in. You have a very reactionary police for force versus a proactive police force. So you didn't have patrol cars that went out and took um, answered calls, or you didn't have a 911 system where somebody would call in and say, hey, you know, my husband's beat me or whatever. So it's all reactive. Everybody that filed a report basically came into the department, the police station to file a report. So you did have some women in there that were um, very seldom did you find one that was actually an armed police officer. Most of the time, they if they worked in the family response unit, uh, taking care of domestic violence and stuff, they were then there as an assistant position. Um, I never, the whole time I was there, met a woman that was in charge of any kind of police station or anything like that. So they looked up to us. You know, when we went to the schools, girls would be like, oh, they're, they would just be smiling and they would just be so like, that's what I want to do. But they also had their own aspirations. The girls would want to be doctors and lawyers and teachers and and all kinds of stuff, which was very encouraging, knowing that they are so like held back and restricted from doing some of the things that they wanted to do. So, And thanks for sending over some of those pictures so that our listeners can see some of the children and the women and um, the culture there. Yeah, Beth, so let me ask you another question. So obviously, uh, I'm assuming you don't speak Farsi, which is, I believe is the main language over there. So I assume that you had, a, did you have a translator that was, you know, with you? Per, I, 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 again, I know that sometimes my questions sound dense, but you obviously didn't have your own personal one 24-7, did you? Or did everyone? I mean, how, how did it work with translators and how did you? We were able my to, team. So um, my team, we had um, four, we had Three women, that, well, we had two young women, and then one was a school teacher who helped us. So we would pick them up at remote locations, you know, um, so we wouldn't compromise their identity and stuff like that. We would take them with us. Um, they would help us. Uh, we had three or four gentlemen that helped us out. Most of the people that helped us were educated. They were they had go, either gone to or had gone to the University of Kabul, and that was one thing that, you know, we found over there that the people that were in the bigger cities where you had the universities were more open to, you know, the Western culture of coming in and trying to teach and stuff like that. So the smaller the city or the smaller the villages you went in, the more restriction you, you receive from those people not wanting, you know, the Americans to come in and change anything. So, but we had some amazing language assistants. Um, could not have gotten through the mission without them. They just, they gave us a hundred percent. We would go into police station. We had safety words. If, if they felt anything at all, any kind of bad vibes coming from the people we were sitting down with for the day, they would give that word and, you know, we were gone. So we had some amazing language assistance. Mm. That's unbelievable. Yeah, I've heard a lot of, of that from other um, people that have served in Afghanistan. And on that note, um, we're, to your knowledge, were most of the people you worked with personally able to get out of Afghanistan? Yeah, we had opportunities to help kind of sponsor them to write letters for their um, citizenship over here, which was a lengthy process for them. But, you know, um, we could submit letters of recommendation and stuff like that. So, yes, as far as I know, all the language assistants that we had while we were there, because, you know, we've been pulled out for quite some time now. They all live somewhere, either in the United States or in the UK. Did you now? Did you make any um, Afghani friends? Whether it was an interpreter that may still be over here now, or just people in general that you you know got to know when you were over there? Yes, uh, the one girl that I that we use mostly every day. She lives here now with her family, and she has small children and. You know, I keep in touch with her and I'm just so proud of her. She's gone to school to finish her college education here and uh, she's she's thriving very well. 
That's unbelievable. That, that's great. That's that excellent. Would... So what what do, what do you think um, in the future? What do you see happening there, or what do you just? What's your opinion on what may or may not happen, or what do you think might happen or should happen? I guess. What I would love for it to happen. Well, I don't know because now it's probably not anything that we all can control since the Taliban has control now. You know, the the, the whole civilization over there is probably receded a hundred years at this point because nobody's going to have the freedoms. You know women over there are going to be treated exactly as they were under the Taliban regime, you know, a couple of decades ago. And it's just very, very sad just to even watch the pictures of the people who would rather fall off a a, a aircraft, you know, and get run over versus staying and being subjected to what they knew their fate was going to be. Mm. It's just heartbreaking, very heartbreaking. And I don't think that the average American truly realizes you know, what these women and these children over there are going through, you know, probably right now. No, and I know we we were talking earlier that a lot of people aren't aware. I mean, when you think of Afghanistan as an American citizen, I, I'm not saying this for everyone, but I think most people in their head, they see a, you know, a bombed out place from the movies or documentaries or whatever, that, or the war that they've watched. And they don't realize that we were discussing earlier that Kabul you know, in the 50s and 60s was a, a vacation destination. That yeah. it was an incredible, we had theater and arts and all that until, mm-hmm. you know, war again, um, you know, took place. But uh, it's, it's it's an amazing story that you have, Beth. Now, you were there for how long? Four years? Yep. And did you come home at all during that time? We did. We okay. had um, a certain amount of leave that we could take. And then when we went to Department of Defense leave, we uh, kind of le- went along with what the military's guidelines were. So we did get leaves as well, you know, with them and we would come home and sometimes we'd stay a day or two in Dubai or whatever and then come home and then fly back over. But it was just as we had to schedule our time as couldn't everybody go at one time, of course. But, yeah, we got to come home. Now, what do you have a message that you would give to the average American citizen um, on on the Afghan people coming here that were our allies? I mean, I know that there are people, you know, just in general who are concerned, like you're bringing in more refugees, this and that. But I, I, I've talked to friends of mine, like, you know, these are great people. Yeah. Would you yeah. would you agree with that statement? Oh, yeah, totally. They are people that were forced out of their own way of life, their own homes, their own, everything that they've, you know, always known with the hope that they would be helped by us you know, and here they are, they're, you know, we have to recognize the fact that they're thrown into a situation that they didn't ask for. They've never asked for any situation that they've been over there. And we can't look at them as anything other than people just like we are. No, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I I couldn't Mm -hmm. agree more. So Beth, I want to thank you a ton. I know I, I appreciate you coming on the show. Um, it's, it's quite an amazing story. Uh, now you, you have no intentions of ever going back. Are you done with that type of work? Or Yeah, actually, um, I came home in uh, 2013 because we uh, went 4.30 in the morning, July 3rd. We had a 5,000-pound truck bomb detonate at the back gate of our compound. So wow. we, we were suddenly woken up at 4.30 in the morning. And unfortunately, we lost about seven really good people that day. and. Um, I don't know. I I I, be, I came to love the Afghan people, but I lost my trust in being there. So I just felt like it was time for me to come home. And that's you certainly had quite the experience. I was going to say I don't know why you would have any trust after earthquakes, AK forty sevens, and seven thousand pound truck bombs. But perhaps on your next trip, I would suggest maybe going south to a, a tropical climate, like you know maybe Costa Rica or something I agree like with that. that. <laughs> Well, Beth, but no, it was an amazing experience, and I'm grateful, you know, every day that I had the opportunity to work alongside of the people that I worked with, uh, meet the people that I did, be exposed to a third world culture, you know, that uh, many times people that live in the United States have no earthly idea what it's like, you know, to live in a place like that where, you know, we have all these luxuries, we have homes over our heads. We have so many things, you know, 
even as women, you know, I was thinking earlier after I talked to you about how we set our standards for, you know, breaking that glass ceiling, you know, and, and being a professional and being recognized for what we are, where women in a country like that, you know, their glass ceiling might be just to be able to go to a market by themselves without a male escort or, mm. you know, to, you know, wake up in the morning and, and have, you know, a third outfit to wear, or it's just, I don't know, it's just so many things that as women in a culture that we're in, that I feel like sometimes we take for granted until we see women that are oppressed, that don't have those kind of basic daily human rights, you know, that we have. So mm. I'm very grateful that I had that opportunity and, you know, it's really opened a lot of doors for me and, and uh, being able to travel and be more educated about other cultures and stuff like that. So I'm very grateful that I was put in that situation. No, it sounds like yeah. it was an amazing experience. Thank Absolutely. you for putting that into perspective. Too. Yeah, no, and it's, it's like we discussed earlier, you can't really say was it good or was it bad. It was just an amazing experience, yeah. I guess. It was. It was. And uh, we happen to know yeah, Beth, today I, I, I is a also, special day. Yes. Is today something? <laughs> I think it's your birthday today. Like I said, after 50, you quit counting. <laughs> okay, well, we wanted to say happiest <laughs> of birthday from Joy and Mark and Noah, the engineer. Yes. And we cannot thank you enough for coming on today. Uh, your story is amazing, and thank you, uh, uh, you know, for your service, for lack of yes. a better term. Yes. I mean, thanks for going overseas and, and doing what needed to get done uh, as a civilian, you know. I mm. mean, it's it's very few civilians would take up that uh, chance. And again, putting yourself at risk, which obviously uh, over there at, at, during the times it is. So thank you so much, Beth, for that. And thank you so much for coming on our little program and chatting with us today. Um, well, thank you're you. welcome. Thank you for having me. And thank you for having a, a, a podcast that, you know, entertains issues like this so people are more educated. Yes. Yeah, and we're going to have some other guests with yeah. some Afghanistan experience coming up. We're going to be going every Tuesday at 3 p.m., this today, Tuesday, and then, of course, the following Tuesday. So, Beth, again, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, and for all our listeners, I think Joy will take us out. Yes, thank you to our listeners, and stay tuned. Uh, please join us again next time as we bring you the stories on protecting our freedoms. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great week. <laughs> 